This is our final week looking at Psalm 3. We've come down to the last couple of phrases in the last section of this prayer that David wrote, this song in which he cries out to God from the darkest, probably the most difficult place of his life. David's journey with Yahweh is one that encompassed his entire life, uh, especially his entire adult life. David had been a shepherd, just uh, the youngest son of many in a family, doing the jobs that other people didn't want to do. Um, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, a man came to his family's home, tapped David on the shoulder and said, you have been chosen by God to be king. David was not given a choice. This was not uh, a box he ticked on a what career do you want questionnaire in high school. He was chosen. He was assigned. Then it was it was years and years and and miles and miles and and many struggles and dark times and and violence and pain before he actually took the throne. And on that day, when David did finally, formally become king of Israel, God struck a covenant with David. We've used that word a few times. The idea of a covenant is a, a particularly relational type of contract where each side has their part to fulfill. And they do so not because of a legal obligation, but because they want to, to work together and to, um, to unite. So they form a covenant, as, as in marriage. I want to read you the covenant that God struck with David, because I think it's important to his, his big picture perspective of what's happening right now in his life at the time of Psalm 3. And uh, we'll come back to this idea a little bit later. This is the Davidic covenant. This is what the Lord of hosts says. I took you from the pasture and following sheep to be ruler over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you go. I have destroyed all of your enemies before you, and I will make a name for you like that of the greatest in the land. I will establish a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and not be disturbed again. Evildoers will not affect them as they have done ever since the day I ordered judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares to David, I will make a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for me in my name and I will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever and your throne will be established forever. That's the covenant. That's the suzerain relationship between God, who is king of David, and David, who is king of God's people. So we come to the end of Psalm 3, and David cries out in these last two phrases, O Yahweh, salvation, O Yahweh, on your people, blessing. In the original language, David would have been crying out, O Yahweh, Yeshua, O Yahweh, Barak, salvation and blessing. The Old Testament's idea of salvation is much bigger and richer and more um, engaging than sometimes we allow that word to be for 
you know, for our evangelical theology. We tend to think of salvation as being something that um, allows us to, to not have to spend eternity separated from God in hell, but instead to be, you know, when we die, we go to heaven. That's salvation for many people. But in the Old Testament, the idea of salvation is much bigger than that. It's much richer. The definition of salvation for, for David in this context would have been God's help against oppression, God's deliverance, in order to live in freedom, in order to no longer be limited in spreading out, in reaching out and sharing God's kingdom and God's wealth with the world. The best parallel I can come up with is um, if you're watching a scary movie and there's a monster prowling the house and somebody's hiding under the bed and they can only sort of see this much and they can see the monster's feet going back and forth looking for somebody to gobble up but they have to stay under the bed or they'll be eaten and then the hero comes and the hero defeats the monster and sends it on its way and the monster is gone and the person under the bed is saved except in the Old Testament idea of salvation you're not fully saved until you get out from under the bed. You stretch your legs, you stretch your shoulders, you take a deep breath, you let your voice be heard in the house because the monster is gone and you are free and you are home. That is the Old Testament idea of salvation. Now, if you're like me, and you know, you grew up in church, you probably hear the word Yeshua, salvation, and your mind immediately goes, oh, that means Jesus. David was calling for Jesus. Well, no, okay, just don't even go there. David was calling for salvation. Jesus was named after the idea of salvation, as was Joshua one who was uh, one of the greatest historical heroes and, and leaders of the people of Israel. Joshua's great accomplishment was that he, he set free the people of Israel from the constraints of living in the desert and, and all the limitations that that put them under. He, he enabled them to enter into the rest of the house into the land that God had set aside for them where they could spread out and breathe and speak Yahweh's name and to spread his kingdom in the world. He set them free from the desert to the promised land. In the same way, you know, we see that idea of salvation in, in everything that Jesus did, which I'm not going to try to recount, but I think some of it is <laughs> self-evident. Jesus was named after Yeshua. Joshua was named after Yeshua because Yeshua is such a huge idea and it brings freedom and it brings empowerment and it brings breath to, to our, our wanting to, to share all of God's goodness with the world. So David is crying out for Yeshua, for salvation. The other important word there in these last couple of phrases of Psalm 3 um, is the word Barak. Yeah, don't even go there either. Barak means blessing. And bar uh, blessing, we, we tend to use that word very lightly. We tend to say, well, God bless you. Uh, you know, and by that we sort of mean, well, I hope something good happens to you. I hope uh, your life is pleasant. Um, I hope that, uh, that, you know, that, that the world is good to you. I hope that the universe is kind to you. Bless you. But in the Old Testament, when someone uses the word blessing, they're talking about something very concrete and very specific and very measurable. 
they're talking about when God speaks good things into your life. God speaks health, um, fertility, vitality, peace, salvation into your life, into the lives of the people that David was trying to lead. But you got to keep in mind that this is the same God who spoke into existence the entire universe. Everything that we can see and touch and these raindrops that are falling on me from this branch over head. God speaks and things happen. God speaks and things come into existence. God speaks blessing into the lives of David and his people. And this idea is um, just so foundational to, to Yahweh's relationship with his people. It goes back to the, um, his, his covenant with Abram. When God says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you. I will do good for those who do good to you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all of the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That is a line from which David has descended. That is an identity with which he would have uh, just aligned himself. That is where he would have found himself, that, that the people of Israel were the source of blessing to the entire earth. So David cries out for salvation. He cries out for blessing, not only for himself personally, but for his people so that it can be spread throughout all the peoples of the earth. When I was rereading the Davidic covenant, which I read a few minutes ago, I was really struck looking at it through the lens of Psalm 3 by what is not there. I was really struck by the things that David would have known were not included in God's promises to him as part of their covenant. I was really struck by the fact that there is nothing in his covenant with Yahweh that makes David expect that he is going to get what he wants. There's nothing there that would lead him to expect, to demand, to be certain of a reconciliation with Absalom. There is nothing in the Davidic covenant that would lead David to expect that he was ever going to see Jerusalem again. There is nothing in the Davidic covenant for David to hang on to except, except the fact that David was part of the big picture. That God had not promised that David himself would reign forever. God had not promised that Absalom would ever reign as king. God had not promised David a happy ending for his family. God had promised David that he and his family were an integral, inseparable part of God's big plan for humanity to bless for our future, for our hope. What David would have been able to take away from that covenant, I think can be encapsulated in the words of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prays, Father, if it is possible, please let this cup pass from me. But if not, then your will be done. I think David's understanding of the situation would have paralleled the prayer of Job, 
when Job in all of his suffering and all of his loss and all of his wishing he were dead said instead to the people around him even if he slays me still I will trust him what I take away from Psalm 3 what I take away from David's big picture what I take away from David's trust in God is a reminder that whatever is happening in the world whatever promises God has made they're not necessarily about me any more than they were necessarily about David in particular they were about God's plan, which began, began with Abram, when God says, through your family, the world will be blessed. And I mean, as a Christian, as someone who follows Jesus, I trace that line down to the cross. And I see that that blessing, that concrete, real, good, that God promises and speaks into existence in the world that happened on and through and because of Jesus death on the cross and his resurrection three days later I believe that that line of, of promise and blessing comes down through me yes as part of his church in the world and that it is my responsibility to know my part in that to know that it's not about me. To know that, yes, I have a role to play. Yes, my suzerain has entrusted me with my little kingdom. And that I can trust him with myself. So, with David, I can just say, O oh, Yahweh, salvation, and on your people, and through your people, blessing. Amen.